US President Joe Biden and leaders of West Asia met in the city of Jeddah in Saudi Arabia recently, and among those attending was Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa Al Qadimi. His presence in the summit comes at a key time for Iraq, which is going through a unique political crisis. No government has been formed after the elections, which took place in October, and neither has a president been elected. The supporters of Muqtada al Sadr, who were the largest bloc following the elections, resigned in June. But this has not worked in favour of al Sadr in any way. What lies ahead for Iraq? Who are the major political players and what are their strategies? Rania Khalik of Breakthrough News explains. So the Iraqi caretaker Prime Minister Mustafa Kadhimi um, is kind of the odd man out at this uh, meeting with Biden in Saudi Arabia because he leads a country that has not only not normalized relations with Israel, it's actually criminalized normalization with Israel. And in fact, Iraqi resistance Shia factions are worried. Uh, they're thinking, you know, why would a caretaker Iraqi prime minister be going to Saudi Arabia to a summit which has been promoted as an Arab NATO, right? And an alliance of like the pro-Israel countries in the region. So they've actually been condemning Kadami's decision to attend, especially since Biden is actually coming from Israel to came from Israel to Saudi Arabia. So it's all very suspicious to them. And so his attendance is very, very controversial in Iraq. Um, but also there's an entire backdrop you know, of internal Iraqi dynamics taking place here. Uh, Kadhimi is an interesting character because he's actually quite, uh, he has good relations with the Iranians. Um, and he has two successes to claim as the prime minister. First, you know, he resisted the Trump administration's attempt to create a civil war between the government and Shia parliamentary forces called the PMF. So that's one. And second, Kadhimi has been successfully mediating an improvement of relations between Saudi Arabia on one side and Iran on the other. And Kadhimi is in a unique position of not just having good relations with the Iranians. He's actually one of America's favorites in the Middle East. You know, the Americans actually installed him as head of Iraqi intelligence and then pushed for him to become prime minister. In fact, the Americans have been kind of obsessed with Kadhimi obtaining another term in government formation negotiations, which uh, as I've mentioned before, have been ongoing since last October of last year, since the elections. Now, unfortunately for the Americans, it's not actually looking good. And Kadhimi is unlikely to make it as the next prime minister. Although, like I mentioned, ironic, ironically, the Iranians are among his biggest backers as well, because, you know, he does serve their interests too. And he made sure that Iraq was given sanctions waivers in order to pay Iran for electricity it provides to Iraq. Uh, among other things. Now, the dominant Shia players in Iraq resent Qadhimi uh, for, as they see him, being weak and for giving this firebrand populist cleric, Muqtada Sadr, everything he's wanted. Uh, Sadr's rivals are actually gathered in this umbrella organization called the Framework, which is basically like an alliance of uh, the Shia uh, the Shia groups, that, except for Muqtada's group. Uh, so all the Shia parties, except for him, and uh, they're backing other candidates who will also be accepted by Iran and America, which has been the tradition in like post -Ira 2003 Iraqi politics is that the prime minister is accepted by both the Iranians and the Americans. So this is all happening, of course, in the backdrop of a really big story, which is Muqtada Sadr resigning. So in early June, Muqtada Sadr showed signs of like anger and instability. And he actually stormed off stage and told his supporters he was angry at them. And then several days after that, he ordered his members of parliament to resign in a move that was quite um, unprecedented. So Muqtada was angry at actually the Emiratis. He thought the Emiratis were messing with him because they had reached a separate understanding with the resistance factions in Iraq after the Houthis hit the UAE from Iraq and it led the Emiratis to reach this like, like I mentioned, political and financial understanding with Iraqi resistance factions. And they kind of sort of banned it, abandoned Muqtada, at least it's how Muqtada said it. So it's all, so the Emiratis were also quite shocked by Sadr, like uh, like th that, that Sadr's block resigned. Um, and then moreover, Muqtada Sadr didn't expect Halbusi, who's the Iraqi like Speaker of Parliament, to accept the resignation. He thought it was just, he initially thought this was just a move to get some attention. He didn't accept that, like he didn't expect that Halbusi would so quickly accept the resignation, but it turns out the Emiratis had actually 
called Halbusi and told him they want him to accept the resignations. Halbusi actually didn't want to do that, but he did it under pressure from the Emiratis. Uh, so it was understood that they had made this deal with Iran and the other Shias to basically protect Emirati interests or interests, and Muqtada was not happy with this. So as a result, members of the framework that I mentioned, the dominant Shia parties, uh, aside, not including Muqtada, gained do dominance over parliament and proceeded with the political process as if Sadr didn't control the country's largest and bloodiest militia. And so on everybody's mind was this concern that Muqtada would send his men on the street and cause violence. But uh, militating against this was the fact that he would have no religious or political legitimacy for this kind of move. You know, he'd gained the largest share in parliament. He tried and failed to form a government. Um, his own Sunni and Kurdish allies did not cooperate and he couldn't persuade the independents. And so he took the seemingly political, politically suicidal decision to order his MPs to resign. So provoking violence would, have, would be like rejected completely by the Shia clerical establishment in Najaf and the Iraqi population. So all of this said, you know, this has been happening in Iraq. Nobody's really certain what Muqtada's goal is. You know, some say he wants the framework uh, to call for early elections, but then the framework will make the new election law and the new election commission. And so Muqtada will be blocked in the coming elections. Others say he wants to bring the system down, but he can't do it by force for the reasons I mentioned. You know, and the Shia factions are actually stronger than Muqtada if he's out of the government. If he's in the government, you know, he has the state behind him so he can take on the factions. But it's also possible that Muqtada made a terrible blunder, which is increasingly looking that way, uh, which is what many Shia political uh, elites in Iraq believe, and that he harmed his own interest. And it's important to remember, you know, Muqtada Sadr, he's not just a politician. He's a religious leader. He has like huge cultural influence. He has this massive movement behind him. And he has aspirations that are larger than just mere politics. I mean, his control of his street did start to dwindle after the 2019 and 2020 protests. And actually the turnout to his protests and gatherings was less than in the past, but he still is a very uh, powerful, strong cultural and religious character in Iraq. Now, Muqtada will likely not cause like disturbances in the street, but he's going to wait for a pretext, you know, such such as like a government failure or some crisis, which he can take advantage of. But until then, he really has no legitimacy to disrupt things because he chose to withdraw. So, again, it's hard not to see Muqtada's decision as this like terrible blunder that may even cause him to lose some support. Um, and then what will happen also is members of the framework, these again, these Shia factions that are, are united under this umbrella organization, all the Shia factions except for Muqtada's, they're gonna try to win the support of the people in Muqtada's base in poor areas, uh, which makes sense to do politically. And meanwhile, the Sadrist MPs who had been initially celebrating their new power and privileges after years of like loyal service, and they finally gained power in parliament, uh, they're likely to, or if they're not already, you know, resentful that their leader snatched it away from them in this likely terrible blunder and sent them back to, you know, back home, unable to benefit from their seats and unable to support their constituents. Now, for as for the Iranians, the Iranians did not want him out. They didn't want Muqtada out, uh, but they didn't want him to form a government without the framework because they knew he would go after the faction, the Shia factions and the framework and cause strife among the Shias. So um, in early June, in anticipation of Muqtada's call for large Friday prayer protests, uh, Grand Ayatollah Sistani's son, Hamid Rida, announced to Muqtada that the Marjaiya, which is like the clerical leadership, disapproved of going down to the streets uh, because it might cause uncontrollable chaos. And then the reaction of the clerical leadership would not please Muqtada. So it was this basically strong, like if passive aggressive threat. And this is why the clerical leadership is viewed as like the safety valve for Iraq. You know, unlike uh, in Iran, Iraq's clerical leadership generates its authority from the people. So they can't impose their authority on the people or like crush opposition. And they, you know, they've been power, they've been empowered since 2003 by basically the weakness and lack of organization of the ruling party.
uh, which allows them to pick and choose leaders. So the Shia ruling elite's failure to basically create a strong leader or a strong system has led to the rise of a strong, what's called a Hausa, and specifically a strong Sistani. And empowered, you know, he's not empowered by force of his personality or charisma, but just by circumstances and the institutions which promoted him and have basically led him to become the embodiment of Shia leadership in Iraq. Um, so, you know, what's expected in Iraq is that the Kurds will announce an agreement over president who will then provide preside over the selection of like a Shia prime minister who will be agreed upon by the Shia factions. However, Iraq has so many bickering factions that really like anything is possible. Uh, and this light might get delayed many more months, in which case, back to America's boy and also somebody Iran likes Kadhimi, gets to stick around a while longer as the caretaker prime minister. But because of all this, you know, chaos happening in the background, it's unlikely that he will be the next prime minister.